Good morning. So today we're going to speak about innovate now or die later. So a little bit about myself, 15 years of experience as a startupist. I was handling the innovation activity of Amadeus in Israel, looking for new startups and open innovation. I was founding three years ago a consulting firm that helps corporations to innovate with startups. Those corporations that understand and realize that they cannot really rely solely, only on their R&D teams in order to innovate. You all know what's in common between the BlackBerry, the Blockbuster, the Agfa, the Kodak, the Nokia, the Yao, MySpace, and many others. They've all been disrupted. They've all been disrupted by technology. They were not able to face the time changes, the technology changes. There is a lot of arrogance in corporations that tend to think that what used to work for them in the past is going to keep working for them in the future. And if there is one thing I want you to take out of my presentation is that what works for you today is not going to be enough in the future. And the reason for that is technology. Technology, the rate of technological change is accelerating. It took 75 years for the telephone of Graham Bell to reach 50 million users. How much time it takes nowadays for a good app to reach 50 million users? A month? Maybe two months? These brands are relatively new, and they are all here thanks to technology. And technology also provides you with new competitions, new competitors. Who could imagine that Alibaba are going to operate robots in hotels? Who could imagine that Alibaba are going to be a significant player in the car industry in China, together with Ford? Who could imagine that Amazon are going to get into the insurance space? And many more, and all thanks to technology, because technology enables that. The idea behind open innovation is the basic understanding that most of the smartest people are not working for you. Now, they also don't work for Facebook and not for Google. It's a matter of statistics. Most of the smartest people are working for someone else. And if you agree with that, let's collaborate with, with these else, with these other people. That's the basic idea of open innovation. And open innovation is the lowest risk and the greatest ROI if you do it right. You know what's in common between all these brands? All these brands are Israeli unicorns. And you know what's in common between all these brands and in total 536 multinationals in this size? They are all very much active in Israel in order to put their hand on the next ways before their competitor does so. And these are good examples of brands that are looking for financial solutions for fintech in Israel. So with open innovation, you want to stay the winner to beat your competitors. You want to improve quality and speed and efficiency, reduce costs, and by the way, also increase revenues by new products that technology allows you to develop. This is a bit about ecosystem in Israel. There is one startup east per less than 1,400 Israelis. Just to compare, in Europe, it's one per 20K. So many corporations are coming to Israel, like those 536, in order to leverage the technology and the very smart people there to provide value to their clients, to their shareholders. And it, really to fill the gap with innovation that comes from third parties like startups in order to beat competitors because they understand, they realize they cannot rely only on internal R&D. And there is a lot of know-how that has been developed in Israel thanks to the fact that over 500 multinationals are actively looking for innovation there. And Today, I will share with you some of these learnings that we learn all the time from this activity of the corporations. They're coming to Israel to work with startups. And the main driver for them to do so is to develop the core capabilities 
and then also an access to talents and so on. But the basic idea is to develop the core capabilities. And of course, there are many, many challenges. And one of the main challenges, of course, is to bridge the gap between the mentality and culture of a startup and a corporation. In Israel, there is a very unique ecosystem of nearly 7,000 startups, hundreds of accelerators, over 500 multinationals, very good universities, a lot of available funds of smart investors, and more and more. The uniqueness of this ecosystem comparing to other ecosystems in other places around the world is the fact that all these players in the ecosystem are sharing, are collaborating, are speaking with each other. And that allows the ecosystem players to move faster. That's quite unique comparing to other places. And when you want to learn about specific domain, at least to learn about the, 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 mo the best startups uh, in each and every domain, you just need to go to Google and search for ecosystem map in Israel, and this is what you get for cyber, this is for deep tech, this is for IoT, fintech, insurtech, AI. Here is the place where you're supposed to say, wow. And they're looking for, to, to work with these corporations in order to run POCs and to be a design partner. A few months ago, I was sharing an article giving some tips, practical tips, to corporations how to do it right, how to do open innovation in the right way and really to get great benefit out of it. So the first tip is to get a real commitment from the C-level and the board, both. Otherwise, it's a waste of time and resources. There is a lot of knowledge around there, but in many cases, it's not around the table of the board or the C-level. So in order to bridge it, what I recommend, and I, can t I, sh I will share with you shortly what happens in Israel, is to have at least one board member around the table of the board. In Israel, it is mandatory that each and every bank has to have at least one board member who is specialized in technology and innovation. Research shows that if you have three like these, three board members with this specialization of understanding of technology of innovation, you beat your competitors, even on the bottom line. And another thing which is mandatory in Israel, 20% of the board members in governmental companies are below the age of 40. Diversity is super important. I can tell you that in S&P 500, the average age of board members is 60. Only 2% are below the age of 55. That's quite amazing, right? The second tip is to have a single point of access for innovation. Startupists cannot really handle many people in the corporate that carry the, the title innovation. It's a mess. They need to know which door is the one to knock on in order to get value from the corporate. The third tip is to share your challenges. Once you share your challenges with the ecosystem, you get entrepreneurs develop solutions for your purpose. And your scouting is much more efficient. This is a very important tip. In 2020, you have to hire only formal people to your team. Those that have the fear of missing out. Those that are curious, that are not motivated by ego, which are the NIH people, not invented ear type of people. That's super important. Another tip is to speak the startup lingo. Startup would never speak the corporate lingo, never. A corporate wants to work with a startup, speak the startup lingo. When I was working for Amadeus, I was resting, resting on Saturday, 10 p.m. on my bed, received a WhatsApp. If I would not answer to these startupists immediately, these startupists would get a feeling that we are not interested anymore. These are startupists. 
Then they'll have patience. You want to work with them? Work according to that. Treat startups as partners, not as suppliers. I can tell you that there are corporations that are paying startups in cash. I mean, not in a suitcase, but immediately. This shows the understanding of the corporate that the startup is not their bank. You don't pay a startup in 120 days, in 90 days, in 60 days. No, you pay them at, by the end of the month, immediately. This sends a very important signal to the ecosystem of the startupists that you really want to work with startups, corporations, that you understand the value. And this is such a simple step, but with a huge impact. And of course, treat the startupists with respect. Budget, yes, running innovation requires a budget. By the way, not a lot of budget. When a startup is coming to a client of mine and is willing to run a pilot for free, I insist paying to. You know, even if I pay this startup 5,000 5, K, 5,000 euros, this will send a great signal to the ecosystem come and speak with us as a corporate. So it's much cheaper than any other marketing budget that I could allocate or spend. How do you measure innovation? When you start working with third parties, with startups, the best thing to measure is the number of POCs. This is how they do it in Israel, those five, over 500 multinationals. And the reasons for that is that the more POCs you run as a corporate with different startups, the more the corporate is willing to work with startups. It gives a great signal to the market, but it also develops internal capabilities between the team members, because when they know how to do it, they will keep on doing a great job and will be more open to work with, working with startups. And this will, this will have a great impact internally. So measure at least the first year, the first couple of years, the measure the success by the number of POCs, not ROI. This is what these 500 corporations are saying. 57% out of them are saying they measure the success by the number of POCs. And this is, by the way, a great research done by PwC and the Startup Nation Central that tells about the learnings of those 500 corporations, how they do it in Israel. So it's a great research. When you're working with a startup as a corporate, don't expect to get equity for free. There were days, maybe five years ago, seven years ago, that the startup wanted to work with a corporate, and the corporate answer was, great, we will work together, but allocate 25% of your equity for free to me. It's not there anymore. Now a corporate that wants to work with a startup should pay for that. They're interested to get some equity, pay for that as well. That's fine. And of course, limit bureaucracy. And how you do it? You teach. You make the legal department, the procurement, and other departments in your corporate understand, really understand, the value of open innovation. They are not bad people. They just need you to teach them. Once they understand it, everything is going to move faster and better. Trust me. This is an example of a company, an insurance company in Israel, that was able to run 35 POCs annually in one year. This is one example. There are many more examples. Thank you very much.